And I will just uh, introduce myself and then I will switch off the camera. So then, because hopefully the, uh, then it will improve the internet connection. <laughs> so um, as, as uh, Victoria mentioned, I will, I will talk today about the transmission of the um, polarity uh, to the cell nucleus. And I will also tell you something about some preliminary results about its significance in prostate uh, cancer. So now I'm switching off uh, my camera. Uh, so uh, I will start with this first part. So the mapping the front on the front rear polarity of the of the cell nucleus. So as we all know, there are two uh, main types of polarities that are present in in the cells. And the first one that is present in um, um, epithelial cells, it's, it, it's called apicobasal polarity. And the second one is uh, present in migratory cells and it's called front to rear polarities, polar, polarity. And this um, cell polarity is associated with the asymmetric distribution of cell org organelles, the overall cell architecture and distribution of uh, various uh, proteins. And the main um, focus of this project was to understand if somehow a cell polarity is translated to the cell's largest organelle, which is a nucleus. So in order to do this, um, so we wanted to study, we wanted to start with the front rear cell polar polarity, and we had to somehow uh, polarize the cell the cells and uh, we did it using this um, my, uh, the technique used, uh, called micro patterning which uh, in which we have the uh, fibronectin coated lines uh, in between a cell repellent surface and cells attached to this fibronectin um, fibronectin coated lines and uh, as you can see, the, the cells that we used, so the retinal pigment uh, epithelial cells were um, nicely por polarized and showed this uh, leading edge and uh, rear tail and were migrating with, um, uh, with um, good speed on these uh, lines. And here we have an example of such cell on the um, micro patterned lines. So as, as I said before, the, here we have the leading edge and here you have the uh, rear uh, tail and you have the uh, Golgi uh, apparatus dis distributed towards the front of the cell. And um, so we wanted to uh, analyze the distribution of uh, various uh, proteins using the uh, quantitative imaging and how we did it. So I, um, I uh, imaged multiple cells on micro patterns. I took uh, this uh, confocal images, which were then uh, projected. Then the um, single images were oriented. So all the cells were uh, oriented in, in the same direction. So the Golgi was, um, uh, was uh, towards the, the, um, the bottom. Then the, Im the single images were registered to the nucleus and then um, a merged uh, image. Uh, um, all the single images were combined into a merged image and uh, such distribution maps uh, were prepared with uh, normalized fre frequency. You can see here, here is the, uh, the scale. And then the, um, the distribution uh, plots were also uh, prepared to, to statistically uh, analyze um, if the, the, the distribution is uh, altered in a, in a significant way. And uh, just to make it more clear, uh, I prepared some images of the oriented and the random map. And you can see it for the, this is for the nucleus. Um, here we have the oriented map of the Golgi and the random map. So we can see the, in the oriented map, the Golgi is always on one side of the nucleus. And whereas in the random map, it's on both sides. And the same for the microtubule uh, organizing center. 
uh, which is an oriented map, it's always um, facing the the, uh, the leading edge of the cell, where, whereas in the random map, it's on both sides. And uh, so in order to study the, the polarity of the nucleus, uh, we had to, we started with um, analyzing the distribution uh, of the nuclear envelope proteins, which is, which is uh, like a logical, a logical way to start because uh, it's, the, um, it's where the, there's the, um, the connection between the cytoplasm and the nucleus and because the, the, the chromatin is encapsulated with the, with the nuclear envelope. So, so we started with this uh, compartment. And uh, so I prepared um, maps for like more than 50 various proteins, but I don't want to show all the maps during this presentation. I would like to just show you some, uh, some the most interesting ones and like the, the most, let's say, significant ones uh, to, to give you the, the impression how it's this, um, how the nuclear polarity looks like. And uh, so uh, I, uh, here I, I will show you the, uh, the free proteins, which are uh, uh, free proteins of nu uh, nuclear envelope. And here you have a single, um, a single uh, image of uh, emerin, a single cell. And here you have such a distribution map. And you can, it's, it was really clear from the single cells that in uh, front real polarized cells, Mm, there is this uh, enrichment uh, of emerin uh, at the front of the cell. And uh, it's also uh, very nicely expressed in this uh, fre frequency distribution map. And uh, here you have the, the map, uh, the, the single image of lamin B and lamin AC. And you can also see that the, these two proteins were enriched at the front edge of the nucleus. And this protein that I showed you before, emerin was uh, particularly interesting because uh, then I started to read and read more about this, um, about this protein. And it's um, present, uh, what was interesting that it was found to be present both at the inner and outer nuclear membrane and um, that it was involved in various um, important uh, processes like actin flow organization, DNA binding, the um, uh, um, keeping the connection between the microtubule organizing center and the nucleus. And also it was recently shown to be involved in uh, mechanotransduction. So I wanted to see if this, um, uh, if we can see it not only because these uh, maps were uh, prepared in, um, these maps were prepared in, uh, in fixed cells. So I wanted to see if uh, we can see this emerin enrichment uh, also in living cells. So here we can see the, the live cell imaging of um, cell transfected with an um, emerin GFP construct. And uh, we can, and here is the normalized intensity uh, graph. And here is the front and here's the rear of the cell. And you can see that uh, within this three hour uh, movie, uh, the, the emerin was enriched at the, at the front edge of the nucleus, as you can see here. So it was really true and <laughs> this, um, this um, emerin enrichment at the at the front end edge of the nucleus, and then I wanted to see if also it can can be somehow um, uh, somehow transmitted to DNA domains. So I used this technique, which is called uh, DAMID, uh, which is basically um, the cells are transfected with. Uh, uh, DNA uh, adenine methyl transferase uh, that is uh, linked to um, emerin and to GFP. And we can, um, uh, in this method, we can visualize the DNA domains that were in contact or are in contact with emerin. 
So uh, as you can, you can see here. And here we have the example of single cell. Uh, so here we have the Golgi, so, so the front uh, edge of the cell. And uh, you can clearly see that this uh, uh, MRN fr uh, frontal enrichment um, caused uh, uh, frontal enrichment of MRN associated DNA domains. So this uh, polarity from nuclear envelope can be also transmitted to DNA domains, which was really, really interesting. So uh, then I started to, to prepare, um, to perform MRI knockdowns and uh, to see what are the consequences of on the nuclear polarity of MRI knockdown. And um, the first thing that was uh, that I observed is that the, the cell architecture was um, was um, kind of altered uh, in um, in the absence of emery. You can see here uh, that the leading edge uh, of the cell was elongated, and also the um, the Golgi was elongated, and um, uh, the uh, microtubule organizing center and was more distant in the cell in the cells to the nucleus than in the control cells. So that were the first uh, consequences. And then I prepared uh, some um, protein distribution um, maps in the in the mock cells and in the um, mRNA knockdown uh, condition. And I observed that um, some proteins in, in, did, did not change in uh, between these two conditions. So in the MOC cells and the MRN knockdown cells, the lamin B uh, distribution map was the same, whereas uh, lamin A dramatically, lamin AC dramatically changed its distribution upon MRN knockdown. Um, then I wanted to see how uh, does it look like for the link complex proteins, which are the, uh, the proteins that um, establish connection between the uh, intermediate filaments, actin filaments, uh, uh, microtubules, and uh, nuclear envelope, both the outer um, nuclear membrane, uh, so there are the, uh, the nesprin proteins and the inner nuclear membrane. Uh, where are uncored the sun proteins. So I, I um, analyzed few of these uh, proteins. So um, for example, the nesprins, so the actin binding um, proteins. And for nesprin one, the, the maps were very similar, um, like with, uh, with emerin present and um, the absence of emerin. And um, this, mm, the map of Nesprin 2 was also almost identical in two conditions. And the same was for Sun 1, so this um, inner nuclear membrane component of uh, link complex. Uh, but for example, for Sun 2, the mm, Sun 2 is, it has changed its distribution dramatically upon emerine uh, knockdown. And then I uh, also an analyzed several nu nucleoplasmic proteins. So because emerin was shown to bind actin, I analyzed, um, so in uh, MOC cells, the uh, nuclear actin was enriched uh, at the tip, at the frontal tip of the nucleus where, where the emerin was enriched. Whereas uh, in the absence of emerin, it was um, more shifted towards to the rear of the cell. And similar observation was with um, the phosphor phosphorylated form of um, RNA pool two. And I also had a look at, uh, had a look at some uh, chromatin markers as the um, constitutive uh, chromatin marker, um, H3K9 trimethylation which did not change the distribution. So it was always distributed like on the sides of the nucleus. 
And for the facultative chromatin marker, um, it was also like shifted towards the rear of the cell upon the MRI knockdown. And then I also had a look at some chromosome territories. Um, so the most of the chrom chrom chromosome territories did not change the distribution upon MRI knockdown. Uh, but it was not true for chromosome three, which uh, had altered distribution, uh, like when comparing uh, both conditions. Uh, so then I moved to um, uh, to characterization of some like um, like uh, some functional um, characteristic of, of the cell cells. So I wanted to see what will um, what will uh, a marine knockdown uh, cause to a cell like on this let's say functional level. So I had a look at this it's not playing okay mm, so i had a look at the migration parameters and uh, what was really interesting is that the, upon the emerging knockdown the cells were migrating with um, higher uh, speed and they were also more persistent so they had this uh, ability to keep the, um, the directionality of migration for for longer uh, but on the other hand, when I um, checked their um, chemotactic uh, um, efficiency using a Boyden chamber uh, chemotaxis experiment, I observed that they were um, less um, efficient in this uh, um, to perform uh, chemotaxis. And then I also had a look at the um, at the, so using the traction, traction force microscopy, I had a look at the, um, how they exert um, forces on the sub, substrate, so the mock cells and the emerine deficient cells. And um, so in order to do this, I used this um, traction force microscopy uh, where the uh, quantum dots are embedded in, um, in some kind of gel. And uh, then the um, cells are plated uh, on top of this gel. And uh, the cells were in incubated for several hours um, on this gel. And we could, uh, and by, um, by analyzing the displacement of these dots, we were able to see, to, to calculate the, um, the force exerted on the, on the substrate by, um, by single cells. And uh, what was interesting that um, the emerine deficient cells um, exerted less force on the substrate, and you can see it also here. And they had also the, uh, the mean area of focal adhesion, adhesions was, um, uh, was uh, much smaller than the mock cells. And uh, so mm, that part mm, told us something that this um, mm, depleting the, the nuclear envelope protein has um, not only uh, effects, uh, so it has effects on the whole um, functionality of, this, of the cell. And then um, um, I asked the question, how is this emerin bias uh, generated? Which was really, uh, really um, important inf information to know how it, uh, how, how, it, how is it done that this uh, em emerin is um, enriched at the this front, front uh, edge of the nucleus. And, um, one idea was uh, that there's this um, continuity between the endoplasmic reticulum and the outer nuclear uh, envelope, so the continuity of the membrane. And uh, I also observed that the, the uh, endoplasmic reticulum is um, enriched at the front uh, edge of the cell that you can see it on the single cell. And here we can see on the, the map of um, 105 cells. 
And uh, I asked the uh, EFOM electron uh, microscopy facility to help us with the um, uh, with the analysis um, of the uh, of the compartment where we can find um, emerine, so the localization of emerine, and um, so we used this uh, immunogold staining uh, and uh, transmission electron microscopy. And uh, we found that emerine was um, localized at the inner nuclear membrane and outer nuclear membrane, but it was also present at the um, endoplasmic reticulum uh, membranes, uh, which was also, uh, we also analyzed its, um, its partner. So it's one of its in interactors, so Nesprin-1. We also found that it was present at the outer nuclear membrane, as literature reported, but it was also found on the, um, among others, on the actin fibers at the, um, in the cytoplasm. So that was a new information. And then uh, we asked, um, we asked uh, f um, physicists at uh, IFOM, um, Marco Lago Marcino, to um, help us to design a model uh, to simulate um, how this emerine bias can be generated. So, so the idea was that we have, so it was quite simple, the idea. So we have more endoplasmic reticulum in the front of the cell than at the rear. And uh, by, um, by the fact that there's this continuity between all these membranes, uh, we have more, um, more emerin at the uh, membrane here. So at this uh, frontal uh, tip of the nucleus. Um, and, um, let me play this one more time, okay. And uh, the simulation showed that indeed it could be possible. So the, um, the, the, the so here is the front edge of the nucleus. Here is the rear, and uh, so in this model the, there are various parameters taken into account, uh, and uh, and we can see that uh, this um, bias of the endoplasmic reticulum can lead to the bias uh, of emerine at the nuclear envelope. And by this uh, proximity ligation assay, we could also see that um, uh, nesprin and emerine, um, so we could uh, analyze the interaction between these uh, two proteins. So uh, the lamin B1 and emerine. So here are the, the dots uh, that are presented here by this proximity ligation assay uh, are the sites where uh, lamin B and emerine are interacting and it happens uh, um, at the, in the nucleoplasm, yes, nu nuclear envelope and nucleoplasm, uh, because this is the projected image. Uh, so, so we can see it here. And uh, whereas the interaction sites of um, nesprin one and emerine are uh, also localized at the cytoplasm. And we can see here that uh, they are um, enriched uh, comparing to the lamin B and emerine. So, so the, these two proteins are also present at the, in the cytoplasm where they are, when they interact with each other. And the last part of this uh, project was, um, was uh, linked to a disease which is called emery dreyfus muscular dystrophy. And this is uh, this is a disease co caused by uh, mutations in uh, emerine encoding gene. And um, this is this is characterized by a slow progression, and uh, and uh, it's the clinical um, manifestation is um, that patients. Uh, have like a slowly um, mass, uh, like progressive muscle wasting, uh, but um, they they live like around 40, 50 
years and then they um, die because of the um, cardiomyopathy. And um, so I obtained from uh, from this Teleton Biobank, I'll, I obtained normal and um, MRI drive was uh, uh, MRI drive was um, muscle dystrophy myoblasts. And I also performed the same experiments. So uh, the same experiment. So I just plated them on this fibronectin coated lines and I analyzed their migration and their front uh, rear polarization. And I performed um, the same analysis as for uh, previous cells. And when I plated them on this fibronectin coated lines, I could see um, I, I had the same observation. So the, the leading edge was elongated in the cells, the, the Golgi was elongated, and the, um, the microtubule organizing center was more distant from the nucleus than in the control cells. Um, and, um, and the cells, uh, um, so I also um, prepared uh, maps of this, all these various proteins, but I won't show it uh, here in this presentation. But what was important that this cell, uh, the, um, the normal myoblast had emerine enrichment that you can see it here. And um, they had also the, the Nespirin-1 enrichment which was uh, completely, um, its distribution was completely altered in uh, MRI Dreyfus uh, muscle or dystrophy uh, myoblast. But then I, um, I transfected the, the MRI deficient myoblast with MRI GFP construct. And you can see here the MRI GFP that it also localized to the um, front edge of the cell. And um, and the Nespring, uh, so after this uh, transfection with the with the um, Emerin GFP, the 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 Nespring one uh, like um, localized um, like in this uh, normal cells, so we kind of rescued uh, its uh, localiz localization. And we also rescued this nuclear microtubule organizing center distance. And uh, we also had increase in the focal adhesion. So we were, by just transfecting the mRNA, we were kind of um, partially revert to, to, to normal uh, myoblasts. So that was, uh, uh, that was uh, something also important to know. And the conclusions from this part is that uh, the front rear polarity of a cell can be transmitted to the nucleus. And uh, emerine is one of the important players in this, uh, in this maintenance of nuclear polarity, but for sure there are many more players and this is just one of them. And uh, the third important information is that the, it's the emerine frontal enrichment is possibly generated through uh, endoplasmic uh, reticulum enrichment. So that was the first part. And now I'd like to move. So I was working in this uh, basic uh, cell biology field for um, like four years. And uh, like last year, um, I, I moved to back to translational oncology field. And I would like to combine these two fields together. So I would like to understand how this nuclear polarity, uh, if it can play um, any role in uh, prostate cancer. And uh, why it's important to study prostate uh, cancer is because it's, uh, it's very common, so it's the, the second most common cancer in men, and it's mainly um, distributed in, um, in well-developed countries. And it's also in, um, and it's, it's interesting to study because it's rather slowly progressing cancer. So we have the, the primary tumor, and then like around 35% percent of patients like up to 10 years after surgery 
will develop biochemical recurrence, which is the in increased uh, level of uh, prostate specific antigen in that we can measure in blood. And then like 10 to 20 percent um, of patients will um, further develop metastasis. So we can uh, like monitor this uh, disease uh, at the level of primary tumor where, where we can we have this one to five uh, Gleason grading. Uh, we can uh, monitor it through this prostate specific antigen um, measurement in blood. And we, we can then, we have then like um, various uh, clinical time points. So like time to biochemical recurrence, time to metastasis, uh, disease-free uh, um, survival, uh, overall survival. And, uh, but we would like to for sure, um, there is the need for better biomarkers that would give us the information uh, like here, what, how, uh, about the patients, if he will um, like by the resection of primary tumor, if this patient is at risk of uh, developing metastasis. And um, also at this point, so sometimes patients have um, has increased level of uh, PSA, but um, some of them develop metastasis and some of them don't. So we need for like better markers to, to, to monitor this disease in a better way. And um, here I would like to just remind you um, about uh, how does the, the metastatic cascade looks like. So we have the primary tumor. Uh, and then we have some invasive cells that um, that escape into the bloodstream, and um, after um, circulating in the bloodstream, they um, travel to a distant uh, site uh, where they can uh, start uh, proliferation and uh, and form a metastasis. So that's just a brief uh, reminder. And uh, right now, so like uh, one year ago, I started um, uh, the collection of various clinical material that I would like to work on in my future projects. And uh, so the material that is already collected is the primary tumors from um, 1,200 patients after radical prostatectomy with the 16-year follow-up. Mm, and then we have the, then I'm, I'm currently collecting and at this time we have um, 105 uh, high-risk um, high prostate patients. So this is like the, uh, mm, so this is like the clinical scale to determine the patients that are at higher risk uh, to develop uh, recurrence and um, so um, this is like a particular group of patients. And then we obtain uh, from them, them uh, tumor draining vein blood, uh, which is done like during prostatectomy um, and peripheral blood and matched primary tumors. So we have this um, uh, three different levels of, uh, so we have the primary tumor and um, the, this kind of first uh, uh, first um, vessel that cells escape to, and then uh, peripheral blood. So um, that's very interesting. So we can follow the cells on this uh, three steps of dissemination. And then we also have um, some uh, metastasis from 20 patients that were um, obtained um, during the autopsy and uh, we have also we are collecting also some bone um, metastasis so from like 15 to 30 uh, patients uh, and we have also like um, lymph node metastasis from 100 patients so this red uh, material in red it's uh, still um, undergoing and um, for sure we will um, obtain uh, material from more, more patients in the near, near future. 
And um, just I would like to end this presentation with this four slides of uh, what I have already done um, to study the nuclear polarity in um, prostate cancer. So I started with this normal prostate cells to see if, uh, if I can see this MRN enrichment in them. And um, I couldn't see it in the cells without uh, uh, and let just play, play that on fibronectin. But when I um, treated them with um, uh, uh, TGF beta for uh, 48 hours, uh, I could see that uh, the MRN is enriched. So it was just to, um, to change their phenotype from like epithelial to more mesenchymal. And then, then I could, in the mesenchymal phenotype, I could see the MRN enrichment. So that could be this nuclear polarity in the cells can be linked to, to migration because these cells, they don't uh, really migrate. And these cells, they um, migrate. They have also a completely different actin filaments, but it's still undergoing. So I'm still trying to, to understand to more what happens in this uh, situation. Mm, then I also observed that uh, in some uh, prostate cancer cell line, the MRN has this like uh, tip-like distribution. So it's altered. So, so it's not present at the nuclear envelope anymore. It's just has this like strange, uh, sometimes it's like a dot-like, sometimes it's like um, blab-like distribution. It's also very interesting. And I also observed it in some primary tumors. So uh, I observe it more in this um, higher grade tumor. So this more, um, so to say, aggressive one. So this is um, uh, Gleason 6. Um, this is Gleason 7, where you can see some, some of the cells have like this um, nuclear envelope-like distribution of emerin and some cells uh, have like this dot-like distribution. Uh, whereas in this more aggressive tumors, um, uh, the, almost all the cells have this like altered distribution of emerin. And then I also um, in almost 500 uh, prostate primary tumors, I analyzed MRN, um, MRN ex expression and it's slightly increasing during the, uh, during the, so between, so here's the normal tissue and here's like the, the most um, uh, advanced um, grade uh, tumors. And what I'm also trying to understand is, um, it's I would like to understand if there is also a nu nuclear uh, apicobasal polarity. So um, I found a way to to to, uh, to obtain this um, normal prostate organoids uh, that are uh, good enough for imaging because, as you can understand, this. To analyze this protein distribution, we need very good quality confocal in images. So, uh, and it's not that easy to, to obtain it with uh, um, with 3D uh, cell culture. But I think I'm in a, on a good way to do this. And I would like to also um, understand. Um, how does the nuclear polarity changes when the uh, cell uh, detaches uh, and it's present in the circulation? So I'm planning to to use this uh, like um, laminar flow mimicking device uh, to see how how it's, how does it changes during the the, the detachment and uh, circulation. And uh, maybe if, if, it, if it, it can play any role in metastasis formation, because here you can see, so when I plated uh, cells on various, so here are various micro patterns of 
uh, here are some circles of various di diameters and I can see that when the cells are plated on, on such small uh, such small circles, the, um, they frequently um, form invaginations in the, in, in the nuclear membrane. And here we have the time course of the, so we have the cell plated on this, such small circle and then the cell is uh, escaping from the circle and the, the, the invaginations are resolved. And I can see it very often at the level of circulating two more cells that they have some invaginations at the nuclear envelope. And I would like to understand more what happens in this process. Okay, so that's it. And I would like to thank uh, especially uh, Paolo Mayuri from IFOM, uh, that it was a pleasure to work with him on this project. And I would like to, uh, I would like to thank also the, the head of my current institute and uh, also my co-workers, Natalia and Julia for collection of, uh, with, for the help with collection of the clinical material. And thank you very much for your attention.